Uh, Jeffrey Cox, what's your position on the Speaker's future? Well, I think he's made a very, very serious error of judgment. Um, he's apologised for it. I think he is going to need to work very hard to restore the confidence of the House. I don't think that you can give the impression, as he has explained as the motivation for his decision yesterday, that the House of Commons is going to be affected in its procedures and its uh, uh, proceedings by external threat. What message does it send to dictators and enemies of this country around the world if they think the seat of democracy in the United Kingdom can be affected by the threats of people demonstrating on the streets? It was weak, but I think his position has to be seen in the light of those who put pressure on him with those arguments. And whoever did, whoever is responsible for putting him in that position and making arguments to him that he should concede an important convention because of those threats has real questions to answer. And I'm afraid that buck must lie at the leader of the opposition's door. He aspires to lead this country. And yet he has made arguments to the Speaker that we should alter our procedures in this House because of the risks to MPs and intimidation. That would have people who occupied this House over the years revolving in their graves. This very hall, in fact. Sir Keir Starmer, you're alluding to there, he's denied putting pressure on the Speaker and making any threats by his future as, as the Speaker. That's denied by both the Speaker and Sir Keir Starmer. He's denying what you're saying. No, I don't think he is denying what he's saying. What he's saying is that he didn't threaten the Speaker. But I think the Speaker has told us already that the arguments that were put to him was that MPs, Labour as well, no doubt, possibly as others, but put by the Labour Party, not by the Conservative Party, were so frightened by the consequences of voting against a motion put forward by the SNP that he should allow this alteration to the proceedings. That was a fundamental error of judgment by whomever did it. And we know that the leader of the opposition attended on him for some minutes and that afterwards the decision was taken. What would be the case if the Prime Minister had gone to see the Speaker? And the result half an hour later was that the Speaker had changed his mind to favour the government. There would have been howls of execration and protest. No, this is a very serious error of judgment. But it is not only that of the Speaker who has apologised for it. It is that of those people who put the pressure on him to concede to those arguments. He's apologised twice now in the space of 18 hours. Is that enough to save his job? I'm not calling for Lindsay Hoyle to go. I think he's been a compassionate, humane speaker who I think was misguided and misled by the advice and pressure he was put under. I think the real question mark resides over a leader of the opposition who has either permitted his party or himself has represented to the speaker that we should concede weak need to external threats and intimidation. How can he carry on if the SNPs, 50 or so MPs, don't have any, any confidence in the Speaker? Well, I'm sure he'll work very hard to restore it. And Lindsay Hoyle has been a, is a decent man who tries his best. What I think the lessons for this are that in future we should not have private meetings with the Speaker by one party. Um, and it has, a, it has looked extremely bad and the outcome has been extremely bad. But he's apologised for it and I think we now must reserve judgment. Do you think, though, that the Gaza conflict is so complicated, so divisive in this country, there are some things that are too big, too, too emotional to debate in the House of Commons? No, that can never be the case. This is the cockpit of democracy. This is the seat of democracy. We must discuss uh, every issue that affects the nation's affairs, and this certainly does. What I don't think we can do is kowtow to external intimidation. And if that is the precedent that is being set by the current leader of the opposition, it begs the question what will happen were he in government mm. and facing similar threats and intimidation. What kind of argument is it when you go privately and backstairs to the Speaker and urge him to concede a long-established principle in this House because your MPs might be threatened outside it? Of course, the Speaker said that, 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 that uh, those standing orders were out of date. We live in a multi-party system, three big parties, not just two, as they were in 79. So that was why he allowed the, 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 the Second Amendment to the opposition, opposition Day motion. But why did he need to? 
Why did he need to allow it? He needed to allow it, and he's told us, because he was concerned that MPs might face intimidation if they voted, as they might well in considerable numbers on the Labour side, for the SNP motion. That was a procedural device, a procedural trickery that enabled the Labour Party not to have to face the question that the SNP was posing. Why? Because apparently members of parliament were being intimidated. You know, if we had kowtowed to that kind of threat over the centuries in this country and in this house, our history would have been very different. Do you think that Britain's enemies, let's call them that, will be emboldened to try and influence, put pressure on MPs to shape what happens in the House of Commons in future, increasingly so? We cannot send the message to the world that the British government, and above all, the seat of British democracy, will be affected by threats and intimidation. Where does that begin and end? And it is, I'm afraid, it is those people who went privately to the Speaker and impressed upon him those arguments who should now be facing the real questions. Why did they bend the knee to the arguments of that kind? What was it? If, if that is the hallmark of a future Labour government, it begs a great deal of questions as to whether the security of this country is safe in their hands. And just in, in closing, Geoffrey Cox, let's leave the Labour government if that happens for the future. What should happen now with Sir Lindsay Hoyle? What, how does he restore the reputation of his office? I think he must work. He must meet the leader of government business. He must meet the representatives of the other party. He must talk to them. He must do all he can to secure their confidence again. I think it's a mighty task for him to do. I hope he can achieve it because I think he's a good man who was led and misled and went wrong. He's apologised for that error. I hope he can restore confidence in him. Well, Sir Geoffrey Cox, thank you for joining us today.